All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Lewis. I work here at the Girl Scouts of Kentucky's Wilderness Road Council, and I am happy to present today's Unstoppable Women series. Um, today we have a Girl Scout named Sammy Knapp, who is going to be interviewing our two wonderful panelists, Kimberly Baird and Luana Redcorn. And I'm going to let Sammy take it away. She's got some questions for these wonderful women. And we are going to go ahead and get started. So go ahead, Sammy. All right. It's nice to be here. So. This will. There we go. <laughs> So to start off, why don't you both tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you do? Okay, well, I'll start. Uh, Kimberly and I work together. Uh, my name is Luanna Redcorn. I am originally from Oklahoma, uh, where I was born and um, came here to Kentucky eventually, and I'm an attorney which means that I went to college and then I went to law school to learn about law and then to, uh, to work in the law. And the kind of work that I do is called a uh, prosecuting attorney. So that's, that's who I am and what I do. And I am what is called the Commonwealth's attorney. And that means that I'm the person in Lexington who is responsible for making uh, sure that when people are charged with crimes, that they are um, held responsible for what they do. And when people are hurt by crimes, and I'll call them crime victims, that they get the help from the court that they deserve. That's, that's kind of who I am and what I do. All right. You know, no. ditto. <laughs> So I am Kimberly Baird and I am the first assistant Commonwealth attorney. So I was born and raised here in Lexington. It's a little bit of an oddity because um, most people are transplants from other places. So I'm born and raised here um, and went to um, undergrad here, UK and UK College of Law. And then I started working here in the office in 1996 and became the first assistant in uh, 2016 when Luana became the elected Commonwealth attorney. Um, and so I handle cases as well, like she talked about. I do handle cases, um, primarily those where children are the victims in those crimes. Those are the ones primarily that I handle. Um, and then as it relates to my job, I guess, as the first assistant, um, it's handling a lot of the um, attorneys. So I play the mom, I play the counselor, I play the cheerleader, I play the problem solver. Um, for the attorneys uh, in the office as well. Nice. So that sounds really interesting. It sounds like you guys have a lot that you do. So what is your favorite part about your career? Well, for me, um, you know, I've been doing, I've been an attorney since 1984. And I've been a prosecuting attorney since 1987, which means I am in my 38th a year as an attorney and uh, almost that many years as a prosecutor. I guess one of the things I like most about uh, the job that I have is I enjoy working with the police. A lot of what we do uh, means working with law enforcement. I enjoy um, working with other lawyers uh, to try and make this community a safer place to live. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge, um, but I also enjoy working with, with victims and, and doing everything we can when somebody gets hurt, when a family is hurt or, or worse, if a family has someone that's been killed. Working with them and hoping that although we can't fix that problem, that what we do helps those people to come to some resolution than that they would feel like they got that there was some justice in what had happened to their loved one. So that's, it's hard job. I mean, it's a hard job, but uh, there's tremendous satisfaction in the work that we do. What would you say, Kimberly? Probably mine is, um, it's going to sound weird, but helping 
both victims and sometimes the defendants. So my path here was a little different. A lot of the people here in the office came here because they wanted to be a prosecutor. And so, um, you know, I've told this story often, that was the opposite of what I wanted to do. And I wanted to go into law, but I wanted to be a defense attorney because a lot of the things you portray on, see portrayed on TV is um, not, not very good for prosecutors. It's incorrect having now been here, but you, you know, it's not, prosecutors aren't portrayed very well. And so you see a lot of times that people defendants feel that they're not you know, treated fairly in the system. So I wanted to be a defense attorney to do that. And then I started here, like I said, in 1996 and realized this group of prosecutors is not what you see on TV, that they actually have a passion for the work because they want to um, protect the community. They wanna work with victims, um, and, but they also wanna be fair across the board. And so what I still enjoy, um, about my job 25 years later is getting to not only help victims, like Luana said, um, getting to, um, you meet them, you know, a lot of times at the worst time of their lives. And so getting to meet with them and talk with them and try to help them understand and navigate the system. But what I've also found is the way that I treat defendants, um, there are people too who've made very horrible mistakes. So you still have to be respectful. They also have things that go on with them that may have caused them to be in your office. And so I try to, you know, uh, when we're very much, there's consequences but uh, for your actions, but sometimes it's, you need to get in a drug program. Let's talk about that. Or you need mental health counseling. Let's talk about that. And you're just respectful and you listen to them. And so I realized that's happening and the help because I don't know how many times I've gotten stopped out someplace or in the store and somebody will say, you don't remember me, do you? So I've learned that, that what that means. And a lot of times they'll talk about the fact that I was the prosecutor and they're wanting me to, they're wanting to introduce me to their children. They're wanting me to tell me how well they've done, the fact that I've listened to them and thank you for putting me in on this path. And so I realize in this job, I really kind of get to, to do both sides of it. Um, and so that's really kind of what I enjoy and it kind of keeps me going. Nice. So I think that's, nice that you get to do something that maybe isn't what everyone thinks is part of your job but I think that mm -hmm. also is a good segue into our next question which is what does leadership mean to you and what aspects of leadership are important in your job do you want to go first Kimberly or do you want me to go I'll let you go and I'll follow okay. up okay well, you know, in a prosecutor's office, um, we're, we're a government agency, so we've got a lot of rules that, that we have to follow. This is not a business where we're trying to make money. Uh, we don't have a product to sell, but we have um, a, a tremendous responsibility, and Kimberly touched on some of that a minute ago, uh, the responsibility that we have to, to fairness, whether it's fairness to victims or fairness um, to people that are charged with crimes. And so leadership in a prosecutor's office is, uh, is to me, is um, making sure that people understand the rules because we have a lot of rules that we have to abide by. It's, it's just not rules about the law and the courtroom, but we also have rules about professional ethics and responsibility. Uh, we have guidelines about how cases are to be prosecuted. So the first thing to me that in our office leadership requires is making sure that the rules are real clear so that people understand what's expected of them. It's hard for people to follow the rules if they don't know what they are. So, you know, you have to be real clear about that. I think Kimberly uh, mentioned this too. And secondly, is just uh, encouraging people in the work that they do want to make sure that people are, first of all, if they can, are doing the kind of work that they enjoy doing. We've got some people in this office that really enjoy, and I use the term enjoy, um, not to mean like it's a barrel of monkeys or anything, but that they appreciate the ability to work with children like Kimberly does, or with domestic violence abuse victims, adults or to work um, with people with substance abuse disorders or with the mentally ill. So 
leadership puts people in the position to do the work that they enjoy doing. And that's what we've tried to do in this office is to, if someone had a particular area that they were interested in, making sure that they got to do that kind of work. Leadership also provides training opportunity and resources for people to do their jobs well. So we try to make sure that people go to trainings and they get educated on the things that they enjoy. And probably one of the most important things that leadership does is to take care of its employees. We have a really good group of people here that I'll call it well-being that care for each other. I myself try to walk around the office and talk to everybody about once a week or so just to check in because it's important not only what's going on uh, with an employee, but it's also important what's going on with their family and what's happening at home. I don't do that to be nosy. Um, I wanna respect people's boundaries, but I also want uh, people to know that we have an office family and community that, that is here for them and can care for them uh, in work. So if people aren't you know, doing well at home, then they may not be doing well at work. So Kimberly called it like being the mom. So I guess if Kimberly's the mom, I'm the grandma <laughs> of, of the office. Um, so kind of that's to me what it's leadership is multifaceted, multidynamic and um, has some very fundamental things uh, and then lots of changes every single day. Nice. Right. Yeah, and I, that was a very good segue because I had kind of written some, I guess, adjectives about being a good leader. And um, a lot of it is um, you want to lead by example because you want people to be respectful of you because you want them to follow in your footsteps. And the, the, the way to do that is to be respectful to be compassionate, to be understanding, to be knowledgeable about what your job is. Um, and, and, so, and you want to encourage people um, and empower people to be the best that they can be. And so if they're seeing that in you, that you're doing that, then that's gonna cause them to do that hopefully as well. And then putting them in leadership positions to bring others along. And so I agree with Alana, there are definitely multi, <laughs> multi aspects of being a good leader. Um, and, and you can definitely tell who those good leaders are by who's following you and what they're doing, you know, by following in your footsteps. Nice. Sammy, we have um, all the leadership in this office are women, which oh, I think is probably unusual. We have, I mean, I'm the Commonwealth's attorney, I'm a woman, the, the deputy, Assistant Commonwealth Attorney Kimberly is a woman. Our office manager is a woman. Our, our director of victim services is a woman. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would say that's very unusual mm -hmm. uh, in, in any government office that all leadership is female. I think it's also um, unusual in that, you know, I'm Native American. I'm a member of the Osage Nation. Kimberly's an African American woman. Um, so we have. Um, a multiracial mm -hmm. leadership team as well uh, in this office, which also makes this office a little unusual when you look at us compared to other prosecutors' offices across the state. And so, I think that helps in in leadership. Yeah. So I was going to ask, how is that different from maybe other places you've worked? And well, I was a um, I practiced private practice in the before I started here and the person in charge with a man. And then I was a public defender before that and the person in charge with a man. I think how it's different is that um, decision-making to me is better when there are other voices and points of view at the table. So if you have a leadership team that everybody's kind of the same, has had the same experiences in their lives, um, they can't, when a problem or, arises, they may not, they may be not able to speak knowledgeably about what the problem is or how the problem is impacting the person that it's impacting because they hadn't had that experience. That's not to say you have to have every experience to be able to make good decisions, but the more 
uh, voices you have around the table, I think the better decisions that you can make. Nice. So we've been talking about leadership. So I was wondering, as you've gotten into your job and gotten to where you are, is there a particular leader you have looked up to or a mentor that you have had that has really helped you to get where you are? Well, I would have to say my former boss, uh, which was the Commonwealth's attorney before me, his name was Ray Larson. We were very different uh, in many ways. Uh, he's a man, an older man, white man, um, and emotional. And I say emotional like he, he really had a lot of passion um, outwardly about things. But there was a lot of things about him that um, are helpful to me. First of all, and we've talked about leadership, and I'm going to turn it more in terms of mentorship because I, I would look at him as someone who really mentored me and really um, had a big role in where I am today. And he did that by uh, pushing me out there, which is sometimes what a leader does, is puts people in uncomfortable situations where they might not be sure that they can do the work, but your mentor or leader has confidence in you gives you the skills you need to do the job and sort of pushes you out there. So that was one of the things he did that I think was really helpful pushing people out there. He also uh, demonstrated um, a really strong work ethic. He was very, um, I mean, I'll say it was demanding um, of us, but I honestly think it made us, you know, better prosecutors. And then he was really uh, fair-minded and, uh, and talked about that a lot. And uh, he, he, I think probably as much as any uh, Commonwealth attorney in the state brought diversity into the office. I mean, we had a very, um, you know, it comes and goes the diversity, but we've had a very rich, uh, diverse group of prosecutors and advocates in this office. So I would say my old boss, Ray Larson, is, is a, a mentor and leader that um, I have admired. Nice. And what about you, Ms. Baird? Well, and, and that's funny that she says that because as me kind of like the third now, I had both Luana and Ray when I thought about that because um, they were very different and there are definitely aspects of both of them um, that I take with me that I try to think of in my um, one, not only doing my job, but also being a leader by example. Um, and it's funny about how that happened when I said lead by example. So things that Ray did that Luann admired, I can definitely see that having worked with him and I work with her, I can see that. I can also see Luanna's um, things that she does differently um, and, you know, and how she is in the office that I, that I take with me as well. So what I definitely appreciated about Ray, like Luana said, his sense of justice, he was the one that kind of pushed me to come here um, when I talked about, you know, wanting to be a defense attorney and why. And, and he ultimately was the one that said, your role as a prosecutor to ensure that justice across the board. Um, you know, he was very adamant. If you don't believe someone did them, you have an obligation to dismiss that case. Um, that, that's not something you see on TV. And that's, you know, definitely went against the stereotypes that I knew of. Um, and so I appreciated that. I, I appreciated the family aspect. I, I tell people I threaten to quit on a regular basis because Luana said, it's hard. It is so hard. And it is so thankless. And we work for the state. And I tell people you don't get paid anything. So you definitely have to have a love and a passion for it. But the reason I stay is because of the coworkers, because of this family that Ray built. And I, and I appreciated that. Um, Luann, what I appreciate about so much is... Um, where she, and I didn't realize she got it from Ray, I'm just watching her, is the way she tries to empower leaders, the, the, that she tries to push people out there to take um, roles, bigger roles, to try to be comfortable in what you're doing. Um, and so she definitely, if she goes up, she pulls everybody up with her. Um, and I appreciate that so much. I do appreciate the fact that she 
um, walks around and cares. I know what she's doing. I see her doing it, that she goes and does this check-in and asks how you're doing. Wellness has, she has done a very purposeful thing about making sure that we have wellness in the office. So whether it's having hot chocolate just to have a stressful day or having, you know, just go breathe for a minute, take a, whatever it is to have us, you know, just be well for a minute to check in. And I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the, I mean, calm under pressure all the time. And so I, I'll joke all the time. I was like, I want to say something, Luann won't let me. <laughs> I'm not, I have to just, I channel Luann. I, I mean, I tell her all the time, grace under pressure. And so, um, so there's a lot of things from both of them that, that I, I think are great leadership qualities that I hope I have, um, you know, that I'll carry forward as I go forward in my career. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. <laughs> So it's really nice to hear about the ways in which you've been able to emulate your mentors and incorporate their leadership styles into what you do now. But as we, as I think about, I'm a college student now, and in a few years, I will be entering workforce. And I know there are lots of other older scouts in the same position. What are, what are some steps that are good to take to find a mentor to look up to and how do you build that relationship? Kimberly, why don't you go first this time? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I have not, and I'll say as mentors, not only work people, um, Ray, Luana, those kinds of things that I work with, but sometimes it's just friends or people in church or something that have said something um, to me, encouraged me, instilled in me something that's help me to maintain and help me to go on, um, you know, I, the, in that support group. And so, so two things, number one, I would say find somebody um, that it's always encouraging for you, somebody that's always, you can listen to, um, then that will listen to you, somebody that gives you good advice, you know, whoever that is in your life, because that'll help guide you on the path that you need to be. The other thing, um, and I tell people all the time, I'm really big about mentoring slash shadowing. Um, find an area that you think you might be interested in and find somebody that does it and go mentor and go shadow because school or just hearing about it is not always what it is. Um, you know, like I said, I had my thoughts about prosecution till I got here and realized that it's not at all what it was. Um, you know, I know people will talk about, you know, other, you know, job opportunities or whatever that you think it is till you get in there and it's something different. And so I'm really big about going to shadow. And if you don't know somebody in that field, find somebody that will probably know somebody in that field and you can always find them. Um, so those are probably my two biggest things to tell people coming up. Um, find somebody that can encourage you and help you know, kind of fill your cup and then go shadow someone. Yeah, and so then um, adding on to what Kimberly just said, Sammy, I, I would think that even as a college graduate, uh, if you have an adult, whether it's your parents, grandparents, someone, um, a college professor, a scout leader, someone trusted an adult in your life, those people can be very helpful in helping you find a mentor because they've got a much bigger set of people that they can connect with than you do. And they've, if they know you at all, they kind of know who might actually be someone good for you to connect with. Um, and I wouldn't hesitate um, if I was a young person to, to ask my, you know, like I said, parent, grandparent, neighbor, saying, if, you know, what you are interested in is, um, I think I heard you talking about collecting water samples before we got started. If that's, if water, um, issues are something that you're interested in. Talk to someone that one of your professors about who can I who can I talk to um, about what it is that I'm interested in. That person may be really knowledgeable about water, but you might not get any leadership skills from them. But just take take what you can get, and then go on to something else. No one person is going to provide. For you all the things that you need to know in life. Um, but 
you know, take the first one that you can find and talk to and share and learn about if it has to do with career opportunities. And then f find another person who you think is an incredible friend and you see that they're friends to other people and how they help other people by, by being an empathetic person and, and spend some time with them and adopt those skills. Uh, I'll tell you this little quick story. Ray brought a woman into our office named Phyllis Cronin who was um, kind of a, a community uh, philanthropist kind of person. She did a lot of really good work with different organizations, mostly related to children, but she and I became friends. And Sammy, this woman was one of the most generous people I have ever met. And, you know, you think generosity is a skill that we're all born with or a trait. It's not necessarily one that we are. And I learned so much about giving to other people by watching her. So there's just so many wonderful people out there that want you to succeed and just, you know, learn a little bit from each of them and, and be open to what they have to share with you. Sometimes just watching um, the best way to learn. Well, thank you. Some good advice. Ah, uh, let's see. So you guys is, is, were again talking earlier about all the different things you do, you, which seems like is a busy time. <laughs> <laughs> Every so, day is a busy day. <laughs> so what are some tricks you have to, to stay focused and stay productive in with such a busy schedule and so many things to do? Well, I'm a big list person, so um, I usually start the day with a list of things I want to accomplish. Uh, but the um, but just as important, I think is, and I maybe this is kind of what you're getting at, Sammy, is um, self care too, or maybe that's a separate question. Um, but you know, just being um, getting through the day by taking care of myself, either at the office or at home. So at the risk of sounding like somebody's mom, uh, eating healthy is really important. <laughs> and I try to really do that. I mean, I'm a meal, I'm a planner. I plan out our meals all week long um, so that I'm not running around at the last minute getting fast food because it's not good for the brain, right? And I exercise regularly and I read and I read things that I don't necessarily enjoy reading, but I push myself through it because it's, um, it's a skill learning to, uh, I think, learning to work through things that you don't necessarily enjoy. So um, being intentional, I think Kimberly used that word previously, just being intentional about everything you do, I think will help you uh, kind of stay focused um, and accomplish stuff and have a list. I have a list, but it's disheartening when I don't ever get to what's <laughs> Um, one of the things that, that I've um, started doing here in the office, and it, it kind of leads a little bit into self-care, um, but I used to, um, there's a friend that's um, one of my co-workers, she's just kind of right across the, the table here. And so if she could hear me like sigh, or I heard her sigh, I'd just walk over and like give her a hug. And so <laughs> it just kind of, that's all, it would just kind of give peace. And so um, it got really bad. She was like, okay, we have a little devotional book. Let's just take, you know, a couple of minutes. Let's read this little devotional. Let's refocus, recenter and go. Then we got kind of busy, you know, or our schedules didn't work out. And so not too long ago, I was sitting here at the table talking to another coworker and I was joking about something and he was giving me a, a Bible verse to try to justify what I was trying to say I was doing. And so I said, oh, you ought to join this little devotional group. And he is very persistent. So what started as two and then three has ballooned, I think, into 11. He just, people are hearing him talking. And then, and so we just start out in the morning, generally in the morning at, for maybe five minutes, read a little devotional. We've got another little um, Hoda from the Today Show has a little thing. And it, and so it just causes you to just stop for a second and center, breathe, 
find peace, find joy, and then I'll start again. So that when I, because when I get in here, I mean, I hit the ground running. And so it gives me a moment to just take a break and then realize I may or may not get it done, but that's okay because I can come back and start it again tomorrow. So that helps me to just kind of center myself and realize there's no need to get into a tizzy, just breathe and, and kind of go from there. So that's helped. And then I try to do, you know, a mental health, you know, whether that's just, I'm gonna walk out and go get Starbucks for a second, or let me just, just close the door, <laughs> whatever it is. And then I can just kind of refocus and keep going. So that's generally what I do to kind of manage my busy day to day for the rings, phone start ringing and everything else. Right. And, and to add to that, Kimberly, and I hope you would agree with this. So many times um, you'll get through the end of the day and you think, man, I didn't get anything done that I needed to get done on my list. But then if you um, reflect on what you've done all day, you've actually done stuff yes. that probably really obviously mattered more in the moment yeah. than what was on your list. And that's accomplishing things too, whatever those things might be. So I say I'm a big list person, but I also like to remind myself when I lay down at night to go to bed, these were the these were things I accomplished that weren't on my list. And, and they were all things that needed to be done or good things. So um, the list isn't everything. Being in the moment is pretty important too. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. And you guys are very good at predicting because my next question was in fact about self-care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, thinking about how, especially these days, self-care is very important. So what are the ways you implement self-care for yourself, but also more specifically, how do you balance your career and your personal life and other passions that you have outside of your job and making sure you have time for everything. I think carving time out of the day for whatever the thing is that's important and, and recognizing it's important. It, to me, and I mentioned this before, it is important for me to exercise. I mean, physical health is everything about our, our, our minds, our emotions, um, our intellect are tied into health whether it's physical activity or the foods that we eat. Um, I enjoy cooking. My husband and I enjoy cooking a lot. And so we make that a part of, of our routine that we plan meals and we cook them together. And, um, you know, I have adult children, so I don't have that kind of responsibility in my home anymore. Um, but if you had small children, it would be understanding how important it is to read a book to someone at night. Or, how to, or to be there for bath time or whatever the things are. I think um, you knowing, knowing what those important routines are and doing everything you can to stick with them, uh, even when it feels like you don't have the time. Mine, when I would go home, I would, I would take my computer, I'd work, 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 because I felt like I didn't get stuff done here. I'd be up late doing it, um, those types of things. And so when I've now got, I guess it's kind of a forced thing. When I go home, my mind just doesn't want to work anymore. Um, and it's, I used to feel very guilty because I feel like I should be doing something. And I've kind of started to accept my mind is telling me you've got to stop and you've got to rest. And so I will usually go home and just do something mindless, play a game on the phone, watch something goofy on TV, talk to my husband. You know, it's just, just kind of, because it's my body telling me you need to stop. And so that's helpful. And, and so I'm not feeling as guilty as I used to anymore. You know, like it's okay to be lazy for a day or two. It's okay. It's okay. Um, and then my daughter is a freshman in college. So we're also empty nesters trying to figure out this new normal right now. And so where before we were, as soon as I got home, it's like, okay, we got to do dinner. We got to do this, this, this. Now it's like, what are we going to eat? I don't know. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's freeing that we can be kind of loosey-goosey about that. When I go to dinner, sure. You know, it's, it's, so that's fun too. So it's, it's very fun just trying to figure out a new, you know, a new path, a new, you know, way of being fun and, and you know, I guess free. 
you know, so that, that so that's, it's definitely helping. That helps with the, the peace and the calmness of myself. Nice. So moving into maybe giving a little bit of advice to hypothetical next generation people, what do you, what do you think would be the biggest challenge for the next generation of female leaders and what advice would you give to them? Well, at the risk of sounding old fashioned, I think that some of the challenges that we experience today, we're gonna to be experiencing in the next generation too. Um, and I think it's the, uh, it's the fundamental challenge of being a career uh, professional, and a wife and a mother, if you choose to have a family. And that is a, always gonna be a challenge, I think, for women. So being um, prepared to develop your feelings and to develop skills about that, I, gonna, I think are gonna be important, always for women. Um, well, I guess the other thing that um, I would say is important for women, uh, future leaders, is to, is to take care of yourself first. If you're, if you're not in, the, in a good place, it's going to be impossible for you to lead. And how do you get into a good place? Well, first of all, you, you um, in my mind, you get an education in whatever the thing is. It doesn't have to be a college education, it can be a skill. But for a woman to be able to be in a position to lead, she needs to be in a position to be um, independent if she needs to be, uh, to be able to have um, a job that she enjoys, to be able to provide for her own home and um, for those around her uh, as, as her, you know, there's no guarantee that any of us will will have a, a partner um, in life. And so that would be one thing for future leaders. I also think that whatever, everyone should have some kind of source that they go to for um, spiritual or soul food, whatever that might be. People have different faith traditions. I understand that or people have different uh, methods of finding peace and calmness, but a good leader has to have those things. So you start off those things now as a young woman, financial independence, a good source of, of spiritual food, whatever that might be. And then the thing that you're interested in, because it's easiest to lead when you're leading uh, in something that you're interested in and that would be my, my advice to, to young women. I'm excited for young women. I do think the world is more um, accommodating and accepting of women in all professions more than ever before. But I still think we're going to have some of those age-old, women will have the age-old challenges that they always have. Um, and uh, we just keep pushing. Sammy, we just keep pushing to the ceiling there. Um, putting women in all kinds of places, hopefully one day in the White House as the president of the United States. Um, because the more that we as these old leaders push, we're, we're making um, a path for the next generation to do so much better than we have. And I agree, because what I wrote down and exactly kind of segue into what Loana said was um, make sure you have a voice at the table um, or create your own table. Um, so I think um, that's one of the things that I, you know, have pushed people all the time is make sure that you are, your voice is being heard, your opinions are being heard, um, you know, because, and I agree, we are, it looks like the move is trying to be more open and trying to recognize that it's not just all one particular race or, or all white men, let's just put it that way. It's, it's you, you know, there's you gotta have diversity at the table. Um, and I think particularly, not only women, but particularly women of color are really kind of trying to make sure that they, they 
get a seat at the table. Um, and I, Luann was aware of this. We had a, um, the Bar Association puts out a publication and they did one, one particular month that was talking about diversity in the law. And that entire book was about females, but there were all white women in that book. And there was not one highlight of any African-American, you know, or any woman of color in that book. And so one of my friends um, got quite incensed and called, you know, reached out and said, all, you know, attorneys, women of color, we met at the steps at the governor's mansion and took a picture to show from across the state of how many. And then we put that in the next month's article. So sometimes people will think that they're doing well and so highlighting, but in fact, you missed a whole opportunity to highlight others. Um, and so we just created our own <laughs> kind of scenario. And so don't be overlooked. So for those coming up, make sure that you are not only you yourself are not being overlooked, but be mindful that there's others than, that, than you just there. And like Luann had said earlier, try to put as many people at the table as you can for diverse opinions and, and ideas and things like that. And I think that would just help everyone move forward in whatever you know particular career or whatever that you're, you're in. Um, and, and they just think that it makes it a more comprehensive and complete work force when you have that. I think that's very true. I, I think about the, when, when I'm in spaces with a lot of men, there's a lot of times pressure to act like, you know, a, a white man in order to succeed. So how do you stay true to yourself when when you're in your career and then what are some ways in which your background has helped you in your career? You want to go Kimberly or want me to? I'll let you go and I'll take my notes. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, well, I think if I'm understanding the question, Sammy, is one, one thing to me I think I've always tried to do is be more prepared than anybody else at the table um, and uh, be knowledgeable and um, because it seems like when you are prepared and knowledgeable, people, most healthy-minded thinking people are going to turn to that person, you know, there could be people around the table that have issues and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of things we can do about that right now. And we don't want to talk about that right now, but, but if you're at a group of around a table with a bunch of healthy minded individuals, men or women, black or white, whatever, if there's a person around the table that is kind and um, listens uh, and is empathetic, and is knowledgeable um, on, on whatever the topic is, most people to me will start to turn to that person just naturally. It, it just seems like it kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a natural phenomenon that happens. And so for us as, or for you as a young woman, uh, if you're in a room with a, a group of people, it doesn't take, many, it doesn't take people long enough to figure out who really knows what they're talking about. And as long as the person that knows what they're talking about, talks about it kindly and listens to what others say, I think in time, that person is gonna rise to the top and people will naturally turn and say, and Sammy, what do you think about that? Because they know you're prepared and you're knowledgeable and even if you don't agree with what they have to say, they know you're not going to be smart aleck to them and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, you know? So I, I, I think that just those skills is, is what will uh, make you excel in that group of people. You can, <laughs> Luann and I have worked together a very long time because literally I was writing the words as she was saying them. <laughs> And that's exactly what I was going to say, you know, about being the one that's knowledgeable and being, I mean, I literally was writing it as she was saying it. Um, and, and so I had just, when you do the work, people will follow because um, they will definitely 
you know, know who to gravitate toward. Um, and then that also kind of helps in how you start becoming the leader because they're looking at your skills. They're looking at your knowledgeable. They're looking that you put in the work um, and did the research. They're looking at your, your tone and your temperament. They're looking at your respect. They're looking at all of those things. And then that's how ultimately they turn to you um, for those answers. And then you become the leader uh, in those scenarios. So just staying true to who you are in that respect um, I think it's what, what will help you kind of move through, you know, kind of the, the old system or, you know, kind of that system that wants to just shove you to the side. Because people, like Luann said, people know, people will look to you. And, 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 and lastly on that, there's going to be times when you may not know the answer. <laughs> and you need to say that too. <laughs> uh, and, and let the person that clearly has more information on that particular issue be the one because you know we all can't know everything all the time and we shouldn't act like we do well thank you so our, my next question is of course you're not always going to be able to get everything that you want so how do you admire someone else's success without doubting your own self-worth um well kind of just like i was saying about leadership. I, I think the most important thing is not to be comparing or judging ourselves against other people uh, in the negative way. So your, the question was, how do you admire someone else without doubting your own self-worth? Kind of back to what, what Kimberly was saying is you, you, you be true to yourself and, and recognize that you don't have all the answers and that there are um, others that do and will help you and that they're not by by learning more or admiring or whatever the thing is to another person you're you're it doesn't cost you anything it doesn't cost you anything and so you're not losing anything by admiring and taking from uh, the great attributes that um, other people that you admire have. I mean, that's a bonus for you to find somebody that's got skills or knowledge or, or personality traits or whatever the things are that you can adopt uh, into your own being. And I, I agree. And I, you have to be good with yourself. So if you know you're doing 100% of the work, like Luann said, it doesn't matter what the other person is doing because it's not going to take away from the fact that you know what you're doing. Now, if you're slacking, you got an issue. And so that's why you have to make sure that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, 100% of the work, so that you feel good about what you're doing. So then, like here, when you've got a family type atmosphere here, you want them to, to succeed. You want them to, you know, to, to rise up and those kinds of things. Because then you have two people <laughs> who are doing very well. And that can only make your organization better, um, you know? And so it just, you don't wanna be petty. You don't want them to, you know, fall and those types of things. A good leader, you know, and a good friend, a good mentor, a good whatever, a good coworker wants, you know, you do what you're supposed to do and you wanna make sure everybody does what they're supposed to do um, and be proud of them and encourage them and be happy for them when they do um, get their recognition or successes as well. Well, thank you. This has been a lot of good advice and I think I will just wrap up with a few more fun questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that we have, where will we find you on a, a Saturday morning at 10 a.m.? Kimberly, you go first on this. I hope asleep. <laughs> 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 that hasn't worked out too well, but that's my goal, at least home in my pajamas. Um, right now, it's a little different. Usually I'm home, you know, preparing to do something, or maybe it's housework or laundry or something that I didn't get done during the week. Um, again, I, as I said, I'm kind of in a new normal right now. So because for several years, Saturday mornings at 10, we were in some volleyball games somewhere. My daughter played volleyball. So we were away and out of town and conference this and, you know, tournament that. And so it's just a little weird not having anywhere necessarily to go. 
Um, so that's good, you know. So so it's just just finding the new thing that I'm doing, and it it, it may change from week to week, um, but it's a little less pressure, and I'm glad. Yeah, same here. I was a soccer mom for decades, so Saturday mornings are different now than they were. But like I said, my husband and I like to cook. So usually around 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, we're sitting at the table in the kitchen, drinking coffee and deciding what we got to get accomplished this weekend and what the menu is going to be for the next week. So uh, we're looking at recipes and I'm making a grocery list before we head out the door. Nice. And then lastly, what is your favorite vacation destination? Uh, well, I'm, uh, my family's fortunate enough to have a little house in Florida and, uh, it's on an Island and, um, that's my favorite place to go. And it's my favorite place to go. Cause we've been going there for decades and there's a lot of really good memories in that place. And, uh, when you're there on the Island, you ride your bike everywhere and you don't drive your car. So it just, it feels simple. And um, and real to me. And I I don't it well easy answer any place warm. <laughs> I don't like the cold, and so any place warm is is where I like to be. Um, my daughter, like when we were planning trips, was one that didn't necessarily like just going and sitting. So we had to plan, you know, something for her mind to do. You know, children's museums or science museums or something like that. So, you know, all of my trips were centered around what she can do to, you know, kind of keep her mind going. So anywhere we've gone, you know, as a family um, has been a, a great vacation spot for us. I, there's nothing that, all of them were good. There's nothing that necessarily sticks out, you know, other than my honeymoon, we went on a cruise to the Bahamas that I got to get back to. But other than that, everyone else is just, you know, wherever we've been as, as a family has been, you know, kind of something I've enjoyed every year. The Bahamas sounds great. Um, I have been here listening to you. Oops, sorry. Um, and I just wanted to say a huge thank you to both of you for being on here. And Sammy, you, if you don't want to continue with engineering, I think you'd have a great career um, as someone who does interviews. Ooh, exactly. Um, great job. It. Um, and I just, you know, something that really um, stuck out to me was that you all both mentioned um, working with all female staff in your office, that is, that happens to be the case here as well. And that also is the case for our girls as they're growing up in Girl Scouts. And it's really awesome that all of us have been able to experience that sort of space. So thank you for mentioning that, um, that that's your work culture as well. Um, and Kimberly, I also really loved your comment about if you can't find a seat at the table, then build your own table. I love that. Um, <laughs> And Luana, I love the, um, the concept of finding food for your soul um, and, and your spirituality, even if you don't necessarily follow any particular um, religion. So again, just thank you all for being here and thank you for taking the time to tell us about yourselves. Um, and Sammy, great job. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. And, and I'll you tell all. you just a little fun fact that I didn't say. I was a Girl Scout for many years growing up, and I also was on the board of the Girl Scouts many years ago. So Where are you? Know. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for serving on our board. Fun time, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Awesome. Thank you all, all for right. being here. Thank you both. Yeah, and thank you for our attendees, and I hope that you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you both. Have a good night. Bye-bye.